thing I would like to bring to your attention this morning that two very lovely little ladies, Judy Smith and Elizabeth Green, are going to make their first Holy Communion this morning. So I would like to ask you to please allow the two little children to come up here by themselves first so that they can receive Holy Communion before everybody else comes up to receive Holy Communion. So this is a very wonderful occasion for these two children. Let us pray that the faith, the sterling faith, the beautiful and simple faith that they have today will stay with them. The next in the line of importance that I would like to bring to your attention is that I and join the monks and the sisters up at the monasteries to wish each and every one of you a very holy, a very beautiful, and a very wonderful Easter. That you will have many more very fruitful ones, not only for yourselves, but for those you love most. You will notice in the bulletin, there's a little slip there uh, with the uh, name and the address of the Dominican sisters in Monroe, Connecticut. Now these are the sisters that, um, the, the, that belong to Bishop McKenna. Now they live in rather unusual circumstances. As a matter of fact, they have a house in which they live and the church and a portion of this is taken up by the city <laughs> to run a main waterway for supply of water. And this is all on one acre of land. And they have a school and a convent and a church. And you know well enough that this is pretty bad for the house that has seven sisters and it is really crowded. There is an opportunity for them to buy some property which they really and truly need. And I know the circumstances. I've been there several times, and it is pretty bad. So if any of you can help them in any way, uh, the address is listed there. Uh, try to help the good sisters, the good Dominican sisters. They're doing a real big job. And uh, so I praise them. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. My beloved people, today, of course, is Easter. It is the feast of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We certainly welcome our visitors today, and we hope you come back. If some of you, however, I'm sure you know this, but I will say it anyway. If some of you, however, are not of our faith, please, uh, we love you as much as anybody please do not come up for communion as you may be tempted to do but at other, other than that though you know you are totally welcome we are very happy to have you the bulletin today deals with a matter which is very important and it all is surrounded perhaps with the whole uh, the, the whole essence of Easter Today is the day that you, sh you must face reality. And you must ask yourselves the question, where exactly is reality? Is reality what I'm doing? Is reality the kind of life that I lead? Is reality the kind of things that I am devoted in? Is reality the seriousness with which I take what happened today? You know, some time ago, the, there was some place, don't know where, doesn't matter, but whoever it was on that particular day, which was Good Friday, decided that they would uh, raise the flag half-mast. And there were people that approached 
these people that put the flag up on Good Friday at half mass. And they ask the question, uh, 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 we notice that your flag is at half mass. Did somebody die? On Good Friday. That shows to what degree we take that reality seriously. And we ourselves, we surround ourselves with all of the symbols that are appropriate. In our houses, our houses are full of the symbols that are appropriate for the occasion. Our families sit around these symbols on a regular basis, day in and day out. But may I ask the question, to what extent do these symbols that we have all around us, to what extent do they influence or affect the kind of life that we live. We've been through Lent. We've seen wherever we could. Of course, I realize fully that in most cases we're not permitted. We don't have the ability to, to exercise our religion properly. But at least to the extent that we can at home, to what extent have we let the symbols of Lent affect the way we've lived? Did we come out of Lent better than we went into Lent? Some of us fasted, which is fine, which is admirable. Some of us said extra prayers, that too is admirable. We did a lot of other things, all of which are admirable. But have these symbols, if we may use these symbols, affected our way of life? It isn't the fasting of the body that we must work or strive to, uh, uh, to keep in the, under control. It is the fasting of the heart. To what extent have we become better? What type of life are we living? When we see evil, and today evil is in our houses, when we see evil, do we shut our eyes at evil? Or do we take a second look at it to make sure we haven't lost sight of something that we should have not looked at? In the marketplace and on the street, do we profess Christ? I don't mean that we should stand on the street corner and preach Christ. I don't mean that at all. What kind of example do we show those who look upon us? When we hear things that we should not be listening to, what kind of response do we give? Do we laugh? Do we assist? Do we add to? Or what? What kind of Catholics are we? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Going to Mass and doing all of the beautiful things, you know, we've just, we're in the resurrection at the moment. You might look at the stone that had to be rolled back so our blessed Lord could rise from the dead. How many of us are able to get past that stone and to see what's on the other side of that stone and in the faith that is required? We come to communion How well do we 
understand what's going on? How well do we understand what the priest is putting in our mouths? How well do we comprehend this? Or is it just another symbol that we partake in at stated times? It is time that we face the realities that are real. The only reality is Jesus Christ. This is not because I said so. This is not because anybody said so and if Jesus Christ is the only reality to what degree does he affect my life or am I taking chances am I allowing what it is that I want to say to take precedence over him to what extent does he stand between me and the sin that I want to commit to what extent to what extent does he stand between me and that whichever it is that I want to what extent to what extent can I take his face and put it upon my face? And what would his face look like if his face were put upon me? What kind of a body would I offer his face? My dear people, as sincere as I know we are, to what degree are we actually, and in reality, playing games with Almighty God? To what extent are we doing without whatever? Only up to the point that it is an inconvenience? Or are we serious about abstaining from whatever? I'm not speaking of just, just anything. Today we have the ability to reach out for anything we wish. We have that ability, and we usually do reach out for it, but yet there is hunger. Something is still hungry within us, even that we have everything that we wish, but there is hunger there. There is slavery there. We are enslaved by the things that we want whatever they are to what extent are we living according to what we hear on Sunday on Monday morning we see each other today ladies and men whatever and we apply some of the rules of modesty perhaps to ourselves as we attend church but to what extent do this same rule that is evident today to what extent do we put keep that into practice tomorrow when we are in the presence of other people how inconsistent are we in the way we practice our holy religion there are members of other religions, of other religious bodies throughout the world. There are members that live in a pagan existence of religion, that live a far stricter rule 
than we do. And you know it. There are people of the Oriental types that live a rigor of religion that would put us to shame. And we know it. And yet we profess to have the true religion, do we not? My beloved people, it is time that we put toys away. We are enslaved by these things that we wish, these things that we demand, these things that we claim to be needs in our bodies. We are enslaved by that. And all these things are doing is enhancing our ego, our own self-advancement. I know that when you come here, you hear such words as we are God's janitors. You hear such words, the priest telling you that you are nothing. You hear such words as coming from the priest that you, that we, not you, we are unprofitable servants. These are abusive words, are they not? Especially in a world that tells you that you, we, man, is the center of the universe. And here you come here, and you hear that you are nothing. Now isn't that something? But isn't it the truth? We are nothing. We are unprofitable servants. We are sinners. And what are we giving to God? Are we giving to God, I don't mean money, but are we giving to God that which we know we are obliged to give to God? How much do we hold back to ourselves? How accurate is the kind of religion that we live? How accurate is it? These are the reality that form the reality that I speak of today. How seriously do we listen to the Word of God? Or do we let distraction completely destroy absolutely every thought of what we're doing? What kind of prayer life do we live? So this is the reality, my beloved people, that we have to keep in mind when we are dealing with the things that pertain to God. The resurrection, the death of our Lord, the suffering of our Lord, was indeed not just something that happened to an individual. It was the beginning of of the fulfillment of his promise. Now either we accept God or we reject God. It's up to us. One, either, either of these is a reality for us. And we have to make a choice. We cannot have both and expect to succeed. We will not do it. The matter that is presented to us is serious matter. How seriously do we look upon it? Or do we let everything, every little butterfly, distract us from that which is important? So, so as we proceed with this, the great feast of Easter, which is the opening of the day that caused us to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. We ask ourselves, how seriously do we take this business of the salvation of our souls? Let us ask ourselves another question. How many of us, serious question, how many of us 
fully appreciate the fact that we do have a soul. How many of us comprehend what the soul really is? How many of us fully grasp that the soul is me? And how many of us can understand that me, me, is going to have to go someplace because what you're looking at is one day going to be put in a box, like it or not, and they will carry this thing off and get rid of it. Then what happened to me? Is me in that box? Then where is me? And what you're looking at is totally capable of putting, will, will not destroy me, no, because me cannot be destroyed. What you're looking at and what you are pampering with whatever it is that you are using to pamper yourselves with, or we are to pamper ourselves with, is going to cause me trouble. And look how little it actually takes for this thing to keep me in trouble. And at every choice that you have to make, no matter where, nor what, nor when, that every choice that you and I have to make, that one always stands out as him who made me, and we'll call him God, and the other thing is, let's call that the apple that Eve bit into. This apple is anything and everything that you want, desire, work for, everything is that apple. How many times in your lives, in our lives, in my life, has this apple always stood out as the greater good? and that I have selected the apple. How many, 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 many times has this happened? And in so doing, do I still expect my God and my Creator when I tell Him I love Him above every other consideration on earth? I tell Him that, do I not? In the prayers that I read, in the prayers that I say, 
do I not say this to God? I love you above all the considerations. And all it takes is one glance at the apple and so much for the love that I speak of. Am I right or am I wrong? It takes nothing for us to cast God aside. At the same time, however, we must remember that we are surrounded by the symbols of God. We have holy pictures every place. We have candles burning. We have little holy niches in the houses with every, all the things that are proper. We have these symbols actually demonstrated to God that in my heart, I truly love him. And it takes more than just ordinary inconvenience, what I'm speaking of. And the suffering of the saints, the suffering that Christ went through for you and for me, was not ordinary inconvenience. Today, we are so pampered and that the slightest little cut or bruise, they will take us into the emergency rooms of the overcrowded hospitals. And for a tiny little cut, we get all disturbed. My beloved people, something has gone wrong. We do not understand the reason why we're here. We forgot it's beyond the limits of our recall. And the thing that we must do today is to turn into ourselves and look at ourselves and see to what extent what is being said actually applies to me. Am I honest before God or am I just an ordinary, everyday, street hypocrite? This is what we have to come to grips with. And we have heard someplace said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven. Have we not heard that? My beloved people, have we not heard that? So, you say this is certainly a wonderful Easter message. It's more of a Good Friday message. But Good Friday message or not, if it will cause me to come just that much closer to reality than it is worth listening to. And prayer is that which will help us. And when we pray, do we mean what we say? Or are we there also playing games with God? God will not be made a fool of by the likes of me. I bless you. I ask only for the best for you. I ask that we put aside doing whatever it is that endangers me, the me that's in me. That's all that matters. And that takes work, honest work. You see these little children, the tender little children that are going to make their first Holy Communion this morning. You remember the day when you made your first Holy Communion? You remember the day how you felt when you made your first Holy Communion?
We've traveled quite a distance from that day, haven't we? How do we feel about host, uh, Holy Communion today? And parents, look at your children. Watch your children. Your children are exposed to things they should never know. To what extent are you allowing this? To what extent do your children see religion as they should see it? Or does religion turn them off and you see them stretch and play and walk away from that which is holy? To what extent is something holy of consequence to your children? Or have they walked away from that which once they held near and dear? And as soon as they became emancipated, they're gone. You know, you watch families with young kids, their stepkids, going up. They lose them one at a time. Isn't that the truth? One at a time, they leave. And the question is, why? When all of the symbols, I presented all of the symbols to them. Which one did I leave out? So I bless you, and I ask the risen Christ to bring the grace that is required for salvation of soul to touch you this day. And to be with you and love you and keep you. You are in our prayers and I hope that we are in yours. God bless you. God keep you today and forever. Amen.